Well, good morning, everybody. In the Institute for Family, Community, and Opportunity, we look at issues of marriage, life, religious liberty, healthcare, education, and welfare. And our next guest is going to discuss how best to move forward on a number of these issues today. Congressman Mark Walker was elected in 2014 to represent North Carolina's 6th Congressional District. Mr. Walker is an ordained Southern Baptist minister, and he served most recently as the pastor of worship and music for Lawndale Baptist Church in Greensboro, North Carolina. Now, during that time, for six years, he wrote and directed something called the Greensboro Christmas Spectacular. And this is a major production, something like 400 volunteer actors, musicians, set designers, and all kinds of moving parts. Now, to create and produce and bring off something like that shows enormous artistic and creative talent, but as anyone who has directed even the smallest church Christmas play will tell you, choreographing that number of people also is a demonstration of enormous patience and good humor. And those, of course, are qualities that will stand him well in Washington. While in Congress, Representative Walker has co-sponsored the First Amendment Defense Act to protect religious liberty and to prohibit the government from discriminating against those of us who believe that marriage is the union of one man and one woman. He has also co-sponsored numerous bills to protect the lives of unborn children. On education policy, Representative Walker has championed the a Act, which is the conservative alternative to No Child Left Behind. And when that massive education law was going through its latest reauthorization, Congressman Walker offered the a Act as an amendment and garnered the support of 195 members of the House, exceeding the expectations for this conservative new vision for the direction of education policy in America. It's one that would direct education authority back to states, communities, and ultimately to parents. And that's the kind of character that Representative Walker brings to his office overall. We are delighted to have him here today to talk about how we move forward on these critical issues that are the underpinning of our society, marriage, life, religious liberty, community. And so I look forward to hearing from him about how we seek a stronger society. Please join me in, in welcoming Representative Walker. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, and more privilege it is to be here. Uh, as stated, I am from the uh, great state of North Carolina, the old North State. This is an exciting week for us. We are in Super Bowl 50. Uh, get some, I don't know if anybody from Colorado here today. Uh, I've met a few. You guys seem to be a little higher than us most of the time, but I guess that's <laughs> another issue. Um, I have been asked to speak a little bit on the social issues which admittedly covers a lot of ground. These are hot topics and, and really in some cases very emotional issues. But today my hope is not just to discuss these social issues, but to talk about the what, the how and the why of the social values and the traditional values that are the foundation that I believe of this country. First, I'd like to outline the highlights of what I believe our focus should be regarding these issues. Secondly, I'd like to look into maybe how we effectively communicate these strategies. And finally, I'd like to leave you with an appeal, an appeal of why these issues are important to the future fabric of our nation. Fighting for these values is a noble purpose. It's a purpose of hope, and historically, men and women throughout the history of our country have been called to stand up for these principles that we believe. See, for the last few decades, our culture has been inundated and continues to be inundated with the undoing of our communities, the taking of unborn lives, the growing population of hungry children, restrictive education opportunities, and really the list goes on and on. You know, some people want to argue about the intentionality. We think back to the LBGA and all the social programs that came out of the 60s. Whether you want to argue whichever side it was intentional to do damage or it wasn't, the, 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 the truth is the test results are in. After 50 years, we know the answers now. And we cannot deny that the federal government has hijacked the American dream and the family has been decimated. We see this in our communities. You are gathered here today. Heritage Foundation exists today because of the concern of a potential catastrophic future for our children for generations to come. And you guys are willing to step up and fight the fight. 
So let's look at that, what, that how and that why. In advancing our conservative course, what is the best strategy or the best approach? During a presidential campaign, we hear much about the American dream. In fact, every town hall, everything that's used, part of the cliche in the speech. But the American dream is, is social at its very nature. It begins with life. Common sense tells us any organization, any business, a flower, most important life is the beginning of any opportunity. It's our most foundational right. If we will not fight for the most basic human rights, then what else are we trusted to fight for? This may be the greatest human rights issue of our day. And if we truly believe in such noble things like freedom and opportunity, then we must push forward, hand in heart, to eliminate every taxpayer dollar that goes to Planned Parenthood. There is no other freedom robbing, opportunity destroyer, and life killer that is more intentional than Planned Parenthood. Now I know those are strong words, and I understand that. But I remember just a few months ago, in the House Oversight Committee, which I'm privileged to serve on and holding some of these agencies responsible, sitting about 10 or 15 feet in front of me was Cecile Richards, the director of Planned Parenthood. And when it came to my time of questioning, I asked her this. Ms. Richards, are you concerned or does it bother you that there are more African-American babies aborted in New York State than born? And as you would expect, her answer was ambiguous or acted like this was the first that she had ever heard of that. But obviously she doesn't agree with us when it comes to life being the inherent freedoms for the individual. See, our freedom to live and work in accordance to what we believe has been placed in the crosshairs by an administration that mocks those who dare cling to their guns and Bibles. Speaking of religious freedom, it is an essential element of the core of this country. Americans past and present have sacrificed much to preserve it. And those of us in Washington, talking about members of Congress, should be willing to sacrifice the same. Life, religious, liberty, the American dream has a very clear point of growth. It's the community. And the building block of the community is the family. The family, which is the very starting point of education. Now, as a pastor for nearly two decades, we could spend the rest of our time Q&A and talking about the breakdown of the family. But let's be very clear. No one knows better about educating their children than the family, than the parents. And that's why, as you heard earlier, I was proud to lead the efforts on the A-plus Act, even though we were told this was a futile effort. We're going to get there, and I think they're going to get there sooner than later. Until we focus on these values like life, community, religious education, liberties, then the family, the American people will continue to hunger for hope. And how do I know this? Because I've lived it. Over the years, we've taken groups, dozens, into places like Cleveland, in New York City, in Baltimore. I remember specifically working with the NEO 360 organization out of Cleveland. And as we began to prepare to take nearly 60 people in there and work in the sports camps and even refurbished Sunbeam Elementary School there in the heart of Cleveland, I remember discussing with the folks, I said, what is it that we can bring? What is it that we can do to make a difference? And I, I shall never forget the response. They said, Mark, just bring us hope. Now, how sad is that, that we have major cities in our countries that are looking desperately for hope? Now, listen, I'm not going to paint a rosy picture this morning that all it takes is a little bit of tweaking here, a little bit there. We have drifted away from the values, from the very founding documents of which our country was created. Nearly 400 years ago, 395 years ago, the Mayflower Compact stated this, in the northern parts of Virginia, in the presence of God and one another, we covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil society. They had hope in their faith, their families, and their community. Standing firm on these faith, these documents were written to systematically protect the most precious values given to them by the hand of God. The truth is, the folks in this room, you know the issues. Whether it's the battle of Roe versus Wade, the failed war on poverty, the educational failures, but it's rare that we're gaining ground, only in small pockets. So if we transition from the what to the how, I would have to ask the question, are we satisfied with continuing to take our message? In our, my vernacular, uh, they use the term preaching to the choir. We've got to move beyond that. 
So how do we take it to our communities? How do we begin to alter that path that has taken us down a treacherous path? I am convinced there is a path and there's a how, but it's going to take surgical-like procedures to be able to pull this off. So there's two approaches, I believe, and this is where the crux that I want to talk to you about today. Two approaches, one vertical and one horizontal. The vertical approach is the one or the how that we direct to our political leaders, to this current administration, to political organizations that have wished to do, do us harm. And whether that message is coming from Washington, D.C., or whether it's coming from college campuses. Recently, we've heard a lot about the term anger. Conservatives, you can't be angry anymore. You, you just got to be okay with everything. Now, that's a little bit of that tolerance mentality. Well, let me tell you folks today, in, in my opinion, it's okay to be angry. It's, it's okay to, to talk about what needs to be done. Our classrooms are being indoctrinated left and right from kindergarten to postgraduate work with progressive secularism. Instead of teaching our children to view the world through the eyes of truth, we are teaching them that, that more political correctness, more tolerance is okay. I'm upset about that. I hope that you are as well. I'm angry about that. Listen, Martin Luther said he preaches better when he's angry. A great author, <laughs> from, the, from the American author from the 20th century said this, Keith Miller, he wrote, there never was a social change in America without angry people at heart. Patrick Henry, the great words, give me liberty or give me death. He wasn't negotiating from a compassionate standpoint at that point. <laughs> now, in September, it was one of the times that I really was amazed at what happens in Washington. Being here 13 months and my colleague Trent Franks introduced what he's called the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act. And as I watched that being introduced into the House, the most human rights bill imaginable, that, that if a baby is to survive an abortion, that we then would ask or tell our health care providers to sustain its life. And as I sat there and watched 177 members of Congress vote against that, I knew then that it was going to take some intentionality. And sometimes even to be angry about this, especially when it comes to our basic human rights. As our liberties erode, it is that emotion that sometimes motivates us to be able to stand and fight. Anger is a very powerful fuel when it's focused in the right direction. Now, in high school, I was able to play some football, played quarterback on, at a smaller school. And I remember tearing out of that tunnel, baby. You were just ready to go. I mean, you just, uh, whatever it took, you were getting out there and you were charging. That usually lasted about two or three plays. Now, as the quarterback, <laughs> when you get hit in the ear hole by the defensive tackle, uh, you realize that as, as angry and as emotional you are, you better have a game plan to succeed. And, and that's the point that I'm making. It's not just the vertical approach that's okay to hold the leaders accountable, but the true success that I believe comes from that horizontal approach. How do we succeed in sharing these social values to these communities? I think there's three quick answers or three ways to do this, and, and, and then I'll move to a little bit more uh, closing remarks. But let me talk about the first one. Be discerning. In life, it takes discernment. The last thing that you probably want to hear from a politician is about discernment. You know, in Washington, sometimes we're not very discerning where we put our servers, uh, whether it's in the bathroom or in the house or the property. It, 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 be discerning. Uh, let's, uh, sharing truth in a harsh or the wrong text horizontally with our friends or families and coworkers can actually do more damage. I ask the question, what's our ultimate goal in being able to communicate? Is it to make progress? Well, let me give you a real life example, all right? There's, there's a lot of men, a lot of guys in the room, okay? Real life example here. Your wife comes home, she's rocking this new haircut or new hair color, okay? All right, uh, and you're getting ready to be asked that proverbial question. Now, if you haven't already noticed, you're already in trouble as it is, okay? <laughs> um, but when she asks you, uh, how do you like my hair? You, you have a choice to make, okay? <laughs> You can be discerning. Now, you might be thinking that purple hair looks better on a unicorn somewhere, uh, but at that moment, you're using discernment of when and how you present the truth of those facts. Now, it's a little silliness, but there's an important point here. Discernment is crucial in having long-term success in communicating our message laterally in that horizontal way that I'm talking about. Not only is it important to be discerning, but you also want to be compassionate. I think this is important. People who are informed at the level that you are can be two-dimensional. 
We can hold those leaders accountable and those making those decisions, yet at the same time, we can have the ability to horizontally share that compassion. At the heart of that compassion is this. If I truly care for my fellow man, there's a patience, a compassion that I'm willing to exhibit, exhibit because I hope for that opportunity to share the truth, those social values that have made us great. This compassion is crucial to successfully communicating why life matters, why education matters. Sometimes taking that same anger, that rage horizontally can do the damage. The old adage of people don't care how much you know until you, they know how much you care is true. This past Saturday evening, I officiated a wedding as uh, over the years of building relationships throughout the community there in High Point, North Carolina. And a lot of times uh, we use that common passage, uh, not from 2 Corinthians, but from 1 Corinthians, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, chapter 13. Um, the, uh, it makes me wonder if you get Article 1 and Article 2 mixed up, too. I don't know. But the, uh, was that okay to say? Here, is that okay? Anyway. Um, but, but it talks a lot about, about you can really change the world. You can give your body to be burned. You can speak with tongues of men and angels. You, you can accomplish so much, but if you do not have the compassion, most of you know what it says, it profits you nothing. So when we're trying to share and we're trying to communicate, this is very important. I love, the, I love the visual that the writer of Corinthians, Paul, gives us there when he says it's like clanging brass. All right, now speaking of a little bit of that musical background, these clanging cymbals, uh, they can be a, a nice ad in orchestra or they can be total destructive. See, for a while I used to think that meant that instrument's worthless. No, it's not just that it's worthless, but if it's the loudest instrument, sometimes it can be damaged. So I thought about this, and this is something I want us to take with us. It's okay to be a loud voice as long as you're doing more than just making noise. Let me say that again. We see this sometimes in politics. It's okay to be a loud voice as long as you're doing more than just making noise. I have a great friendship with Mike Lee. Mike Lee is a wonderful mentor and is doing great work for you and for this country. Let me tell you that right now. The reason I like Mike Lee, it's not that he's just a conservative. He's an effective conservative. And that's what I mean by being, it's okay to be a loud voice, but do more than just make noise. And I think that's important when it comes to this line of thinking as far as being compassionate. You have to see the need. The young lady that's facing the toughest decision in her life, my wife Kelly is a Family nurse practitioner, worked several years and uh, still flies on a helicopter, worked in a level one trauma center. Some of the encounters to see society and to see the brokenness and to see the hurt, do we look at just from a political perspective or can we be genuine enough to build that relationship, to be able to share the compassion, to be able to share what's important to us? Hope. H-O-P-E. One of the very first things I did after being elected, I launched what I call the Hope Commission, Healthcare, Opportunity, Poverty, and Education. It's okay for Republicans to talk about those issues. And what I did is I went into the different communities. In fact, I don't mind telling you that we've got 16 members. It's led by a, a Democrat who, who endorsed me, an African-American pastor who has 4,000 members in his church. We have to talk about these issues. Why, why wouldn't we want to? We have the truth on our side to be able to share what's important, to be able to go in these communities. One of the great privileges that I have is to go into some of these places. They've never heard about individual liberty. They've never heard about hope and opportunity. The only thing they've heard is how they should grow up and be dependent on a federal government for every need, fiscally, physically, financially, emotionally, sometimes even spiritually. That's the opportunity that we have when, we, when we're compassionate. And finally, the third one, not only be discerning, be compassionate, but be engaged. You are here today because you've already taken up that mantle to be engaged. You're doing everything that you can to make a difference. And sometimes that even means learning a different language. It wasn't too long ago that uh, we were over in Japan visiting some different military installations. We went out to a restaurant, and uh, as you do, you get to talking sometimes. Well, this is the chef's doing all this kind of crazy stuff on the grill there. And all of a sudden, I realize there's something that's getting ready to land on my plate that has two eyes looking at me. <laughs> and I, it's called abalone, or it's a Japanese snail. Now, some of you may enjoy that, but if I could have spoken the language there, I could have said, give that to the guy sitting to my left. But I couldn't do that. Then the little silliness there to make a point here. 
It's important that we just don't talk at people, but we learn to talk with people, to learn to understand the language. And sometimes that takes patience and sacrifice, but most importantly, we have to engage to get that point. I walked away from a ministry career and took no salary for a year in running for office to share these foundational truths that I believe can make a difference. We have to continue to talk about these issues, but we only win back the hearts by being discerning, showing compassion, and staying engaged. Don't look past people. I've done that, I'm guilty of that. A gentleman by the friend of mine, a gentleman by the name of Tom Tragesser, a friend of mine, texts me every morning with a short devotional thought. But there was a time where I looked past him and he called me out on it one day. We were doing some ministry things and he was assistant coach. We were coaching a little upward basketball, little league. And, you know, just in my radar of life, you know, a good guy, but, but I really didn't get, take the time to know him. A couple years later, our path circled again. And he told me, he was honest with me. He said, Mark, he said, you looked past me. I had to think about that. I said, Tom, you're right. I did. You know why? Because he didn't meet my sphere of where I was headed. God used that to convict my heart to make sure that people that intersect our lives that we don't look past, but we use it as an opportunity to share our values. The moral foundation of this country is undeniable because our rights are not derivative from man. As you believe, they come from Almighty God. And here's what I've come to realize, and this is my closing challenge for you today. What's the cost? You know, I was talking with a few members maybe three or four months ago, began to dawn on me that this doesn't get resolved. The solutions that we're looking for is not going to be more money. It's not going to be in another piece of legislation. It may require a lifetime commitment. I, I had to think about that. I, am I willing to spend or give the rest of my life to make a difference rather than just to make noise into communities and people who don't hear the messages that we do? The fertile soil is not Washington, ladies and gentlemen. It's your families. It's your neighborhoods. And if the wind is going to unfurl the sails of this great nation once again, it must be led through our local citizens, our homes, our towns, our churches, and not from this overreaching arm of the federal government. But I am convinced that if we can rediscover just a fraction of that indomitable spirit, our great nation can once again sail majestically. The time is now. May God provide the path, and may we have the courage to follow. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Congressman Walker, for reminding us how important the character and the quality of our leadership is on all issues, but particularly on these fundamental issues that affect our society. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions, so let's go over here. We'll begin here and then in the middle. Good morning, Congressman. Good morning. Uh, as a former teacher, uh, I discovered a lot of problems with stuff like Common Core and values teaching. They say we're not allowed to teach values. They forget values like tolerance, acceptance of homosexuality. How do we, how do we engage this not only as uh, politicians, but also as Christians and leaders in our own community? Great, great question. I, I guess most of you heard that. In, in the education indoctrination, if you will, the amount of political correctness, I mean, think about this. If you look at this past Iowa caucus, look at the age group of, of who supported Bernie Sanders. 75% of the 18 to 25-year-olds went with Bernie Sanders. There's a mindset, we use the buzzword of socialism, there's a mindset of allowing the federal government to make all your decisions. What we have to do in that case is to be able to talk about why it's important that you as an individual are in control of your future in the context of being able to make the best decisions. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that it's important, first of all, to try to connect that family union, unit. The very important that the structure of the break in the family has tributaries that run. In fact, I believe this, all other social issues, problematic issues, stem from the breakdown of the family. I believe that's strong. Until we come full circle and begin to build back the family, some of those places, you're the only voice that, that child may ever hear. Teaching is a noble profession, and I thank you for doing that. But what you're going to have to do, and 
wrap it up with this. Is in the confines of the structure, I know your school system or how much limited opportunity you have, you've got to show the life to that young person. You've got to be able to communicate that person. There's more than what he's been told because that child has been told that he never has to worry about anything else, even thinking for himself, because the federal government will always be there to bail him out. I hope that you'll have success in doing that. Thank you for the question. All right, we have one here the Thank you, Congressman Walker. Your colleague, Congressman Pitts, chairs Values Action Team. As you know, he's retiring, and I am running in an open primary for that seat. So I hope to join you in this battle. I'd like if you could give us an update on the Values Action Team, and then if I may, one more question. It's astonishing to me that four out of 10 children are born to single moms now. How can the tax code be changed to stop incentivizing that? Let me take question number one first. As far as values, you guys are familiar with our values voters team, uh, chaired by uh, Mr. Pitts there. What we're doing is constantly focus in on, on the social issues over the day, the fights that we have, the one where we draw the line in the sand. We recently made some progress with HR 36 early this year that ends all portions after 20 weeks. Uh, my wife being in the medical community and uh, really could probably back it up further than that, but that's, that's at the point we have scientific evidence or proof that the baby actually feels pain in that process. I hate to be that graphic, but that's basically what the HR 36. We have to make continued more strides there. Uh, it's, it's the first pro-life legislation in decades. Uh, that's a, it's, if people say, well, we need more. I understand that. It's a huge step in the right directions. Having a, a group of people here in Washington to focus on these values are very important because what I've learned in Washington, uh, nothing happens by happenstance. You have to be intentional. Uh, the second part of, of your question, was talking about the budget as far as what do we do with four out of ten uh, young ladies who are having children out of wedlock? Was that basically the premise of your question? Code. And as far as regarding the tax code, well, we we, uh, we were we were unable to get to the Senate along with a few other hundred pieces of legislation, but uh, we did get a balanced budget uh, that did call for a tax code reform, uh, and I believe it even went as far as detail. I don't remember specifically that issue, but the greater issue to answer your question. I'm going to share this. I don't know if it's the right context or not. We actually had a night on the House floor that I led uh, called Hashtag uh, Get Moving Mitch. Uh, and that was based <laughs> on the premise of pieces of legislation that are sitting right now in the Senate that we've done nothing with. And some of that is tax code legislation, reforming the tax code that I hope that uh, sooner than later we get to move on. Thank you for the questions. And I hope, hope you can join us there. Yes. More questions? Yes, right here. got a mic for you right there. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Um, my question is related to human trafficking. Yes. You didn't mention anything about it, but mm -hmm. what do you think our country needs to do when it comes to human trafficking? Well, thank you for the question. We were actually the first new member of the 114th Congress to pass legislation, and that legislation was the Human Trafficking uh, Detection Act. And what it did, it did that the CBO uh, rendered it budget neutral, but what it did is it required any individual that worked for the government of the state to go through mandatory training to not only look for the victim, but also to look for signs of the perpetrator who might be trying to smuggle or pull somebody in. Uh, over the years, uh, we've had a lot of involvement with this as a minister. Uh, my wife also helped uh, launch the Sexual Assault Nurse Examiner Program at Wake Forest Baptist University Medical Center. North Carolina is now number nine in human trafficking because of our, our massive interstate uh, system. Um, that, that's the first step. There are other things that eventually became law. There's other things, obviously, that we've got to be paying attention to. Uh, it is something that is frightening as far as the amount of growth. It's a dirty little secret that nobody likes to talk about. Uh, when, when, when a sporting event comes into town in our area, the furniture market, um, I, I've met with the sheriffs that on two clicks on the internet, you have a full smorgasbord of opportunity there. It's, it's frightening of how easy. And it's also amazing how networked it is. And I know Joni talked a little bit about defense a little earlier, but if you look at the core of this, ISIS is funded by two ways. One, some of the bootleg oil they commandeered, but a lot of their funding into the millions of dollars is human trafficking. Or they're catching these girls, they're working with Boko Haram, smuggling these girls and now selling them for profit. I think that's something obviously that is a social side of it, but it's also a national security one as well. Thank you, Michelle, for that question. Other questions? Back to you. Demographers have uh, lamented the 
demise of what he, what they call a success sequence. Um, you finish your education, you uh, get married, and then you have children. How do we make marriage fashionable again? I mean, it's a, it to me is the root uh, of many problems. And as you say, making family central again is, is so important for teaching values and shaping our young people. But um, but the success sequence seems to have broken down. Thank you. It, 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 it has. Uh, my, my short answer is this, um, and I can say this because I come from this world. If, if, if the church was doing its job, uh, we wouldn't have as much responsibility to get done in the government as well. We've got to get back where, uh, where we're preaching the truth uh, and we're teaching the truth, and that is the family unit and the design of marriage that God created, one husband, one man, uh, to come together and build that family unit. Uh, yeah, like I said, if you look at a lot of our systemic issues, whether it's poverty, all the different ones down the line, you'll find that there's mo more than likely there's a family structure breakdown. In this, I'll give you a statistic. In the early 1960s, the family unit across the board was intact by about 80%. Now we have communities where it's less than 20%, thus creating those issues. But, but, but a stable, children need stability. Some of you work with children. Uh, the inconsistency of being jerked here and going here, it, it's confusing for them. So when they don't have that example of some place where there's st stability, or where there's a place that they're, they're, that they're able to go to find that confidence, to find that support, to find that love, it can be an issue. Thank you for good questions. Any other questions? One to your left. Thank you. I applaud your, your work with the unborn uh, children, but no one's talking about the need for the new mother to have a maternity leave so she can stay at home with that child, sometimes especially uh, young unmarried women have to go back to work to hold down a job when they don't even have a full night of sleep because they're with the children. Can you address that? Sure. It, it, it is a residual effect for the systemic problem that we're seeing, but there are organizations that are doing a great job. I, I worked one back in Greensboro, uh, the Greensboro Pregnancy Crisis Center. They just don't walk you through the time of, of having the child. They're there and supporting you even afterwards. I hesitate to say or create a new mandatory spending government item to say that that's something that we need to implement. I'm sure you're not advocating that. It goes back to really what I said earlier, the compassion side of communicating our message and laying a foundation. It's not an overnight fix, but it is one where that young lady knows that there are people who genuinely care about, not the way she votes as we've seen in this administration, this culture, but truly the heart as far as being able to talk about the values that will literally change her life long term. I think that's the best way to continue to do so, is to communicate that, not leaving someone out in the cold. I, I, I know many organizations and, and many nonprofits that will reach out and that will extend themselves for anyone who is going through that situation, whether they're a private-public partnerships or whether they're nonprofit altogether. Uh, I, I don't know the situation you're referring to or what community is, but I'm happy to, uh, happy to address that or, or get hooked up if there's a specific incident you're concerned about. Well, Congressman, we really appreciate the perspective that you bring, having been a community leader and now being in Congress and leading in the civic realm. And we look forward to many great things that you'll accomplish in your time in Congress. Well, thank, thank you. you. It's my privilege to be here. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you.